Yes, hello everyone and welcome to 60 Minutes Live on NTA Awarded, the pride of the heartland. Um, today's edition is going to be a very special package. Special in the sense that and His Excellency, a governorship candidate of the APGA, or Progressive Grand Alliance, is here in the studio to tell us what his pact is with the Imo people. And uh, this is the election, and the man is not a popular, the word popular politician you used to know. He is a young, gentle, nice, caring looking gentleman. Even by the time I bring him on, you definitely know that I am not patronizing, but <laughs> I am doing my job as an observer. So I have here the man called Anthony Chidebere Ejogu a financial management and business development expert with a combined experience spanning nearly three decades. A bona fide son of Imo State, uh, had his primary school education in uh, uh, the Imsu uh, primary uh, university, uh, Imsu University, Imsu Imsu university Imsu primary Imsu. school somewhere in Aba and then um, he had his uh, secondary education in the Opwala uh, St. Peter's Clever Seminary School, where he graduated as a graduate of that secondary school, as a seminary school. You know, somebody who is or was trained in a seminary school uh, nearly wanted to become a reverend father. But again, it is all about education. When you get to a place, you decide to branch or continue or the other case. That's the case of uh, uh, Anthony. Chidebere Ejogu. Um, after his uh, secondary education, as a vibrant, well brought up child, he proceeded to the United States of America where he obtained uh, uh, his first degree in uh, management, industrial management uh, business. So he attended uh, the University uh, of uh, Akron in Ohio. And uh, that's where he obtained his first degree, and he went to so many other universities over there where he studied and got MBA and got into so many businesses and got trained as an industrial management expert and as a uh, financial management expert as well. He began his uh, professional career with the Dune and the Brad Street Corporation in Rock, uh, Rockville somewhere in the U.S. there. So Tony Ejogu is a man of integrity, capacity, character, and all what it takes to be a gentleman. It is my greatest pleasure to bring to you the man carrying the flag of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, the party that has produced governors in this state. Uh, that is uh, introduced to you. Uh, he's popularly known as Tony Chidebere Ejogu. His Excellency, you're welcome to Six Minutes Live. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for so many wonderful compliments. And good morning, Ndimo. Good morning. Yes, I was viewers. just saying what I see. I was not doing it because it's not a compliment. It's at least uh, looking at you. That, that's you're a fact. Gentle, you're calm, you're uh, cool. That's a fact. Uh, yeah. you, you don't look like uh, the usual politician who looks <laughs> harassed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I'm not saying that the uh, politicians are harassed, but there are some who are really in trouble. So let me start this way. Mm. Um, you slept, you woke up, mm. decided to come up to offer your service to be the governor of the state. So what is it that motivated you to take this decision of coming to serve Imo people as governor, if by his grace, on the 11th November 2023, you uh, pronounced the governor of Imo State. Thank you, Tony. Um, I am going to respond to this question sincerely, uh, without giving you any political answer. Um, genuine passion to see things work again. Genuine passion to offer my service to Indimo. Um, Imo, the heartland of the eastern region. Imo once the pride of the eastern flank now has become a battleground of uncertainty things have gone belly up things have not been working i left the shores of this country in 1992 tony and since then it seems like nothing has changed we are um if i can use this oxymoron 
uh, vigorously stagnant, if not uh, retrogressing. Um, I, grew, I grew up in the state, you know, and I remember in those days uh, when I was in the seminary school, we used to come home uh, on breaks. You go to places like Aladema, it was like a burial ground, quiet, serene. You can walk from Douglas to another place without any issues. Imo, one of the most elitist uh, states, we are known as the most educated people. Imo has a literacy rate of 97%. Now we are talking about unemployment. Unemployment over 56% in this state. We are talking about a dead economy, almost. You know, so what has gone wrong? That's the problem. So we, all of these things uh, bedeviling the state, I just have the passion to see things work again. I just want to offer myself to make sure that things work again. You look at countries like uh, the United Arab Emirates. You look at even here, best practices in, uh, in Rwanda that just um, decided to rise out of the ashes of near destruction. Now it's the, one of the destination points in Africa just because someone dared and had the audacity to do things differently. Someone had a vision and a dream to rebuild the place. Um, all of these things, Tony, and you come back and uh, the things are not going well. You think, what's going on? And I just had to uh, take the bull by the horn and offer myself and say, we have what it takes. We have the exposure. We have the experience. We have the knowledge. We have, most importantly, the character. You just mentioned that earlier. The character to there and have the audacity to challenge the status quo and say, things can be better. Uh, luckily, the emergence of P2P has given, uh, enlivened the hope of the, uh, of the common man, has enlivened the consciousness of the youth to say, there could be a better Nigeria. There could be a better emo state. And that is why I have offered myself for this. And I uh, seek the support and mandate of my people to uh, give us the opportunity to usher in a new dawn, a new dawn that will set this state back on a new trajectory of peace, growth, and unlimited, boundless prosperity. And it can be done. I, I, I just ask okay, our people yes. to do that. Let me yeah. come in here. He said, uh, the, 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 my part with emo people, mm. he said you had a dream and a vision. Absolutely. So may we have those points, the bullet points that you have as your dream and the vision that many, if given that this opportunity to become a governor, by the time you implement them, then the emo will be the pride place for everyone and those yet unborn. Well, then I just um, released my five-point master uh, uh, manifesto. And if you look at my manifesto, you will see those points. Uh, topmost on the list of every concerned Imo State uh, citizen is security. Of course, nothing can happen in an unsafe environment. Um, security is one. You know, um, the second one is basically the economy. You know, we want to run a digital economy, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. It goes way beyond that. And most importantly, get some institutional and government remo uh, re reforms done. And then, of course, to stimulate the microeconomic engine, which is the pra private sector-driven economy, is our, our vision for uh, harnessing the agro-resources that we have so that we can draw people out of poverty and create a lot of employment doing that and also um, uh, ensure that there is food security and get ourselves uh, away from the federal dependency of allocation. So these are some of the issues um, that I have looked at, I have observed, I have mirrored my manifesto with best practices across the world where it has worked in Europe, it has worked in the United States, it has even worked in places like uh, uh, Rwanda right here in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, His Excellency, mm -hmm. the Governor Candidate of APCA, of mm -hmm. Progress Grand Alliance, you have marshaled out your five points as your manifesto. The first one is security. Yeah. And security is issue in the, in the country today, but with special reference in the most states. Mm -hmm. There's no need talking about or letting you know, asking you what is the security of the state. The mm -hmm. issue now is that what are those critical elements or parts or introductions you are going to put in place as solutions to ensure that IMO becomes a place 
somebody can stay, live, and enjoy and they relax. Because with statistics coming out here and there, the, the is over maybe saying about over how many thousands of uh, emo people have been killed within the shortest possible time, mm. either through unknown government, uh, robbery attack, uh, this and that and that. So, what is the pact you have to kind of bring back emo to a safe and a livable place where business and uh, every other thing will thrive? Indeed, Tony, um, the major focus here is to bring back the glory days of Emo State. And before you can proffer any solution, you have to first of all do a proper analysis and a prognosis of the problem. Let's ask ourselves, where did we get it wrong? How did we get here in the first place? How did we get here? And that's very important to know. Let me say this. I remember I was in the United States then, um, in the Niger Delta area then. Um, there was a gentleman called uh, Kansel Wewa. He was an activist. Kansel Wewa kept talking and shouting about the unfriendly environmental practices of the I o IOCs then. And nobody paid him any mind. You know? He, he was jailed and uh, of course you know what happened eventually. But later down the road, the young men there became restive, started bearing arms. And this is the result of the militancy, you know. So it's important to find out why are these things happening. These things just didn't happen overnight. It took time. Everything that we are seeing today has been festering and brewing over the years. We are, it's just like a spectrum. We're just seeing the tail end of it. You understand? So we have to go back to the drawing board and find out what happened. It could be cases of um, um, agitation, you know, disgruntled people, you know, um, frustration in, in the Niger Delta case. That's the case. Here in the Southeast, you know, we all know it could be part of the separatist uh, 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 movement. And so it is important to understand that. If we understand what happened, why these people are aggrieved, why they are doing what they're doing, then we can now come to the table and start preferring solutions and start asking questions how we can dialogue. Not that there, there are no solutions. There are absolutely solutions that we can use. Uh, technology is there to mitigate and prevent crimes and uh, to even uh, rapidly respond to all these uh, uh, backed actor criminalities in the state. Yes, but in the first place it's important to take, because it's a hydra-headed problem and we have to take more multi-faceted approach to this. We have to engage these people and understand what are your grievances? Let's come to the table and dialogue. It's not like you're dialoguing with um, uh, 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 um, terrorists or whatever. No. But even in Afghanistan, the United States, they had to dialogue with the Taliban, the, with the ISIS. You understand? Otherwise, you are fighting a lost battle. You can't fight an ideology with guns and bullets. You just have to fight it with a superior ideology. So these are not uh, by power or by mind. It's by wisdom. And that's the approach we're going to take uh, and while we're also taking or exploring other avenues. Uh, don't forget that these bad actors are not acting alone. You know, there could be uh, sponsors uh, and there could be certain individuals that are just uh, victim of circumstance. So we need to be able to diagnose this thing very, very properly and be able to uh, provide good solutions that will be sustainable and that will be lasting. You know, and that is what we're talking about. But okay, let, let, let me ask you this: All these things you are saying, are you saying that, for instance, the government of Imo State today mm. possibly have not been able to apply this, or they, they don't know how to approach it? That because uh, we have been hearing all about, we are going to do this, we are going to do this. So, what would be the difference? Are you saying that they, they don't have the the, uh, the the methodology of either discussing with people or knowing exactly what to do to stop? The, the rate of killings, especially in Imo State. Tony, I just said that um, there are different approaches to um, solving insecurity. And um, I just told you that you need to apply a non-combative measure approach. And sincerely speaking, I would say the government has not applied that strategy. You know, when you want to fight an ideology with guns and bullets, uh, it doesn't work. You, you rather exacerbate the situation. 
you know it's just like the the arabs uh, you know they have a mentality during the during the war if you kill one person you're they recruit 20 more so you're fighting a lost battle united states were in, in afghanistan for 20 years they had to pull out so you can't do that if a certain group of people especially in the niger delta area they kept talking talking nobody heard them you need to listen to people you need to be empathetic to the plight of the people you need to be a government that feels the problem of the people when you do that people believe that oh you can feel our pain you understand where we're coming from when you sit down on the table and negotiate it, nobody gets it all but at least there's a genuine and sincere effort being made towards resolving the situation. I tell you what, if we hadn't taken the uh, combative approach in solving this insecurity in Imo State, probably wouldn't get, it wouldn't get to this point. And we have to also take it from a holistic point of view. It's not just Imo. Imo has never, never uh, sister states. Whatever happens in Iyala, in Anambra state, can quickly trickle into Imo. Whatever happens in Port Harcourt can tr quickly trickle. It might not be the, the violence. It might be just displaced people now uh, coming into Imo to just collapse uh, 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 an already uh, non-existent infrastructure like it's happening in the Northeast now. So these are the issues. So we also, a government must also relate with sister states so that we can also come to the table and see if I'm protecting Imo and the borders are porous in Ihiala, in uh, uh, the other part, uh, LL side, anything can happen. So while we are ch ch chasing these approaches, one, dialogue, two, actually providing people with the actual security. You understand what I'm saying? If you come in and say, oh, no more sit at home. All right. What measures have you put in place to make sure that the people come out to go about their business are safe? You can't just say that without also dialoguing with the people. Because when you call that truth and say, no more sit at home, go about your business, the bad actors say, okay, we'll tell you who's in charge. So it doesn't work that way. Okay, let me ask you this this way before we go to the next other one. Mm -hmm. For instance, many people have been become victims mm. of this insecurity. Mm. People's lives have been lost, her families have lost so mm. many people. Houses have been bought, bought. Yeah. every other thing, if you go to Olo area, if you go to uh, Osun local government, they mm. also go to Ejeme Okunu, yeah. Zombe, yeah. all those areas. Yeah. So uh, even as I, uh, up to uh, the, the another hotspot now is Okibe. So in case if by his grace, you mm. met the governor. What will you say? What will you What will you do to those who have suffered losses out of no uh, 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 cause of theirs? Oh, you're not talking about uh, compensation to victims. That's what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, yeah. You see, um, one life lost is too many, and um, we have all been affected by this. Sadly, um, I have been. You know, no family in Imo State or in the Southeast would say that they have not been directly or indirectly affected by what is happening. It is not a good thing. But you can also, as a governor, I, I, I am not yet the governor, but I can tell you from an uh, economic standpoint, you can't make such pronouncement that you would be able to compensate everybody. But you can put up policies, you can start doing things, set up critical infrastructure, social welfare system, all these things that will make people understand that, ah, uh, you feel our pain. You are part of us. And we have begun the journey of a safer community, livable community, where the government is listening to us. You've come down from your high horse. You're part of us. And let's start the journey of rebuilding Imo together. OK, Simple. that's the word, rebuild mm. Imo together. Absolutely. So, yes, uh, the second uh, uh, point of your manifesto is mm. economy. Absolutely. And they say it's going to be not only on that economy, you're going to make it a digital in a digital format. Mm -hmm. So what are those uh, uh, things you think we can use to improve the economy of the state? Remembering that there's no factory or manufacturing uh, company in the United States. Mm -hmm. So what magic one do you want to bring in to ensure that the economy of the United States is up there? Tony, it's not a magic wand. Uh, this is reality. You can't give what you don't have. Administra administration and governance is a serious business. And my own issue with um, our country, Nigeria, has been that of uh, bad leadership, successive bad leadership. 
we have always put a square peg in a round hole and it hasn't worked so for me personally this is I talk about digital economy and you can look at it literally and say oh digital well we're already running a digital economy anyway I mean you've got the you, you've got the banks on digital platforms and all that but that's not what I mean by that what I mean by that is employing technology and being able to equip our people with the right um, skill set so that they can thrive and opening up the global marketplace for them via technology and set up the right infrastructure so that we, our young youth who are technology savvy, can be able to uh, uh, compete favorably and offer their skills in exchange for income, just like they're doing in India and other parts of the world. But first of all, the right infrastructure, the right investments must be made. One, you can't run certain things um, like project management, uh, Scrum Master, Agile, all those things here in Imo State. Folks are doing it in Lagos and Ogun because we have fiber optic cable, broadband. You need that in order to be, to be able to connect in the global marketplace, digital marketplace, and be able to offer your services. So these are the right infrastructure that we must put in place in Imo State, first of all. Okay? And then set up tech hubs where our youth will be trained, give them the right training. You can receive uh, certifications in uh, 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 networking. You can receive certifications in Scrum Master, project management. You can receive certifications in even customer service. You understand? In India, a lot of the customer service that you, uh, 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 jobs that you have are based in India. So why can't we do the same thing in a place like Imo State, in Oweri, for example? So these are the things that I, I'm talking about. These are the ideas that I'm bringing to the table because <sighs> is massive. Our young men are very intelligent, very resilient. Go to the business centers and see what they are doing. So, but we are limited. We are limited because we haven't got the infrastructure. Power is not even there. For you, for you to run these things, you must have steady power supply. So we're not even talking about that. So the right investments must be made and the right vision applied towards seeing these young men, young women, and being able to give them what I call the, the pull empowerment, not the push empowerment. Push empowerment in the sense that y you get a bunch of uh, 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 children, oh, I'm empowering with uh, Keke, uh, Imo Boss, uh, sewing machine, and all that. Okada. Okada. At the end, they will ruin themselves. How, how does that help them? A young man that is intelligent, just got out of school with a computer science degree, is, is very sharp can do things. And we are giving him Okada to go and write. In about a month or two, he's going to abandon it. It's not, it's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't end up in an orthopedic hospital. So, but now you take that person, you see that they have a certain flair, all right? The pool empowerment takes into consideration your God-given talent and abilities, and we give you the opportunity, equip you properly, and bring you up. You have that. You can compete favorably with your counterparts across the globe. Then we open up the gateway and be able to headhunt them with agencies across the globe that's what is happening and that is what we're going to do here in Imo where a young man and a young woman can sit in the comfort of already here and be earning two thousand five thousand dollars a month it's going to happen here in Imo and that's my promise to our young youth in Imo state we have a vision for it we are doing it already I see it on the board of a technology company called Vimo uh, Technologies we are doing it my brother is in the United States, is running the company there. We have an office in Lekki. Actually, we had an office here, where my campaign office is here, now you know where. Before all the kidnapping and gunmen killing, we moved the office to Lekki. So we have uh, staff managing projects here in Umo, here in Nigeria, projects in, in the United States, and they're being paid in dollars. We can do the same thing here with the support. Customer service, I'll give you an example. If I come here and set up a customer service center, and I get a contract with a MasterCard, Visa, or whatever, okay, for 300 lines. That means 300 lines, uh, 24 hours open. That means I have created 900 jobs. If they're earning $10 an hour, see what is happening. Automatically, 900 people are earning over $750,000 a uh, month. Imo is going to change. It automatically will become a cosmopolitan city. These children can rent apartments. They can buy cars. The young girl in Yimsu will not go and prostitute her body because she doesn't have a means of livelihood. And we can do that. Just customer service alone, giving support. But we have to create that environment. 
It's easy for government to say, oh, the government responsibility is to create enable. How are you creating that enable environment? Do you have the vision to do that? Do you have the global contact to do this? You can't give what you don't have to. Okay, let's say, look, let me even say this. There is already an established digital economy ministry in the states. Yes, I'm aware of it. Yeah, so I think uh, according to yeah, I think it's, uh, Imo State is about the first state that has domesticated it mm. from uh, mm -hmm. the federal. So, mm. so which means uh, if you are given the, 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 the opportunity by Imo people to, to, to become the governor, you are going to expand that or uh, possibly build on it. The ministry you're talking about, I'm aware of it. I watched one of your programs. All right. Yeah. The gentleman sat here and said, oh, we have this. We are training children on website design. Then after that, what happens? Oh. Well, no, wait, where is the infrastructure for them to go out and try I, I, and flourish? I, I have as I say, oh, you watched the, you, I you did. this program. Oh, absolutely. So 60 Minutes Live. Well, yeah, yeah. The, uh, well I, 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 I knew I was coming here, so I just <laughs> wanted to see what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. That's a good one. So you now, part of the other uh, points you said you got in your manifesto is the institution and the government reform institutionalizing the institutions and get them reformed yeah so in what exact what what does that mean how can it translate to an island couple to the people, more people and make things work please can you explain to us tony yeah. that aspect of my manifesto is the dearest to me and the bane of our malady i'm not talking about emo i'm talking about the entire nigeria you understand? But you are, the, you are to be, the, you are forced to be the governor of the state. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. You, no matter how much money you have, you cannot build from the roof down. You have to build from the foundation up. We have gotten it wrong. Key number one on that uh, institutional reform is what I'll just break it down. Simple to you is being able to restore the democratic accountability to the local levels it's important which means make sure that the third tier level of government which is the local government uh, um, uh, administration. Uh, administration works not only just working as we say oh government will, local government will work is a cliche no real autonomy financial and operational autonomy is important so that once you do that every other thing falls into place and we can grow organically i'll tell you why now listen i can't make excuses for um the current administration or oh, you go to Olu road you can drive with your eyes closed go to akibo road you can drive come on now let's be real i mean these are mundane routine things that the government must do and if you're talking about roads, let me tell you one thing. Let me shock you. Nigeria has over 200,000 square kilometers of roads spanning over this country. And 18% of those roads are what we call federal roads. 16% of them are what we call state roads. And a whopping 66% of them are what we call local government roads, which means the local government roads are more in number. Every community, every road spans through a local government. So what does that mean? When you now kill the local government strata and the funds are not going to them, what happens? Then you stay at the top there and you want to build all the roads. You can't do that. You have to be able to uh, uh, decentralize these things uh, and allow self-rule. Whatever is happening at the top, at the state level, must be replicated. But now you don't have a, an, a democratically elected local government chairman. You don't have councillors. They can't let out contracts. They can't build roads. Am I going to sit in a way and know the road that is bad in Ejemekuru or in Izombe? You understand? But while I was in the United States, we had local government. And I'll tell you, in this fourth republic, things started going bad after the administration of Achiku Denwa. That is when we saw last local government function. And after that, in 2007, it, become fa it became fashionable for government to now have uh, what they call sole administration, uh, administrators, and community development centers. That is a sham. So then, Opera Chepe was the local, or not local government chairman. And we were receiving an average of 90 million to 120 million in a or not every single month. We were able to let out contracts, the councillors were able to do their job. It, it, it just enlivened things. It just made things, the local governments, a beehive of activity, commercial activity. Things started happening. But when you took that away, then you moved the government away from the people. 
and they encourage urban drift well that's when you, you encourage the brain drain the opportunity drain the frustration the cut sets in these are you know some of the drivers of some of the insecurities that we're seeing sincerely so these reforms and you're talking about okay like the, 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 the prison reforms and all that the government has said we cannot continue we can't sustain having prisons now the states can run their own prisons good you have a young man who just because of uh, hunger or whatever go, goes there to do one thing or the other. First offender, you lock him up in a prison, awaiting trial for seven years. Come on. What, what, are you reforming the child or are you even turning him into a hardened criminal? So these are the things that we have to look at. It's not prison. It should be a correctional facility. So we have to, now that the state is going to bear the burden of running prison yards or a correctional facility, then you must look at also fix the judicial system where people are not going to be awaiting trial for seven years and not, nobody has seen their file. This is, these, these are some of the things that affect th this society. So when I talk about institutional reform, it is because I want to pay attention to the things that affect the average man, the, 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 the falconizer on the street, the, the teacher there that is worried about putting in 35 years of service and is going to be faced with post-retirement poverty. These are the issues that we're talking about. And these things are not being uh, addressed. We come here and we give political statements and all, all is well. The gentleman sat on your program and, and said, oh, uh, salaries are being paid. Uh, these are the, if salaries are being paid, why are people saying some certain uh, sect of people have not received salaries for the past uh, eight months? These are, these are the realities that we're facing. So the distrust between the government and the people is because you say one thing, it doesn't translate to the, the realities on ground. And it must be faced. It must be fixed. So people want to deal with a government that wears a human face, that relates with them, that addresses their concern. So this is where we are different. This is where we bring in the desired uh, 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 fresh bread of initiative and idea that the Imo people are willing to, to embrace. The Imo people are, are, are desirous to sign a new social contract, a new social contract that will usher in a new dawn, a new dawn of servant leadership, a new dawn of servant leadership anchored on the principles of accountability, responsibility, and transparency. Because this recklessness in, 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 in our system must stop. Brazen impunity, it must stop. And the lies, come on, the lies. Okay, you're building roads, uh, that is good. But how is that affecting the economy? And how much is the cost? And how much is the cost? And these roads are, of course, uh, uh, government policies that has no design uh, uh, thinking that affects the people. So if you build a road from Owori to Okigwe, tell me, how is that increasing the IGR of the state? How is that creating employment in the state? Right? That is just another avenue for I wouldn't say siphon, but it doesn't. It doesn't add anything. We are thinking up with my policies are going to think about how to engineer and create wealth. Are you saying that uh, such a road is not necessary than creating wealth because uh, you must have an access to your farm, to your village, um, good motorable things, meet up time, or what? What? Uh, I didn't really no, Tony, I haven't said that. Okay. These are critical infrastructure that are necessary. That you should I, not allow for. I said these are mundane routine things that the government a mother that breastfeeds her child uh, are you going to clap for her <laughs> that is what she's supposed to do you understand I have just also told you that if we fix the local government system sincerely every other thing will fix itself organically right if you give those monies for the local government they will fix their roads you can have an oversight function right these roads are not told so they're not bringing any revenue they are good they are important. I'm not saying that. But fix the fundamentals and every other thing will follow. If you haven't fixed the f fundamentals, you're just wasting your time. Yes. You are an industrial management and financial expert. And a part of your policy is private sector economic development. Mm. Because they say any business run by government does not survive. Mm. It's rebuilding corruption. Mm. And all sorts of things. Mm. So now, what this your private sector economy driven uh, policy? Mm. How are we going to carry it up? Because there's no, uh, we don't have a more of uh, a private uh, investors in the state that can 
be able to anchor it. So please, can you explain to us the, mm. the issue behind the private sector economic policy as part of your uh, manifesto? Yeah, very, si very simple, Tony. When I, when I said private sector driven economy, what I mean by that is um, allowing, well, of course, creating the in, in enabling environment. Creating the enabling environment is not just talking. It is creating the right policies, making the right investments that will allow private sector to thrive. Now, I talked about power. Now, luckily, the uh, 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 power generation and transmission has been removed from the exclusive list of the federal government. So you can actually, the states can actually generate off-grid uh, 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 power. Now, part of that is, if we now tap into our resources, we have gas here, if you want to go that route. I, I believe that you know, we are revol evolving and uh, the globalization, we have to key into those policies of renewable uh, clean energy, right? And if we do that, there are incentives for keying into, especially with the climate change rules, so promoting greenhouse gas, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission and zero CO2 emission is important. There are incentives with the uh, World Bank and all that to do that. And if you do that, you're creating a cleaner and safer environment. You can do that via solar. You can do that via hydro uh, energy generation. You can do that via you know, uh, good management of uh, municipal solid waste and biological waste, turning waste to energy and to creating wealth. So if you do that, if we set up industrial clusters and set up captive power plants that will be feeding those things, one, you have 24-hour power generation in those areas. The ancillary business uh, activities that those will create, even the backward integration business impact that that will create is service. If we do that, we are going to sell power. Right? If we're selling power, it's a private company selling the power. Right? They're making money. They're creating jobs. You understand? So, and even the logistics alone is that. In, in my agro uh, resource revolution, yes, all those things are creating opportunities for private sector to thrive. If you have power, the gentleman running a barber shop in my village, like in uh, Mpwemeke, who has a better pass my neighbor generator that will spend 2,000 naira to go and put fuel, and of course, uh, and he's char only charging 500 naira or one, how is he going to uh, make, it make, make it work? So if you cut that, he has power supply. He can actually charge you 500 naira and still uh, go home happy, make enough money. So it, it trickles down to everything. The folk organizer on the street can run his business. The salmon can run their business. A lot of things are going to work because you are using your scarce resources and making the critical right investment in these areas that will now allow even policies on ease of doing business. It's important. So oh, I am speaking with the governorship candidate of uh, APGA in the person of Tony Ejogu Chidebele. Chidebele is his middle name. Uh, he was a seminarian and uh, later went to the university, went to the United States to lead the industrial management uh, uh, course where I, and he's a financial expert. And he's been talking to us about his five-point agenda, five points, how to make Imo to be another state, another country that will surpass whatever we are seeing today. So, um, if you want to join us, you can still join us. We are still we are, we are streaming live on Facebook and um, uh, YouTube. Just die, uh, type in there NTA or Live. You will get us there. It is there on your screen. So let me go back to him. The man. Uh, he is not the type of uh, seasoned politicians who have, he has not called names. I'm very happy that he's very modest, very, very decor decor decorous with his uh, language and the choice of words. That's exactly what we want. That's what NTA stands for. So, sir, let's now move forward. Uh, you have told us all about your five points the security, digital economy, reform of the institutions and the government reforms, private sector driven economy, and the food security and the agro allied uh, revolution that would make. Food. Okay. Do you want to say something again on that uh, 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 agro industrial area, or can we? Yeah, yeah. I can tell you a little bit. Okay. Now you know is 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 on record that Malaysia came here and picked up uh, palm uh, fruits, and they've gone back. They've modified that, and today Malaysia exports palm oil 
while we are now importing palm oil, what has gone wrong? You know, it goes back to going back to the uh, to, to the drawing board and finding out where did we drop the ball. I have studied, you know, Ndibo, the southeastern region, before the war, during the war, and post-war. And you can find out that, um, I don't know, there seems to be a deliberate attempt not to progress as Ndibo. You understand what I'm saying? Before, you yeah. Educate me there. Good. Before the war, the southeastern region was projected to be the fastest growing economy in the world. They said certain people, certain economies in Africa, it was the Southeast and the Southwest. But the Southeast. And you see the deliberate attempt by M.I. Wada, Louis Ojuku to strategically position industrialization in the Southeastern region. I was just talking to one of your chap out there before I got into the st studio. And he said, they were refining crude oil in Anambra State during the war. So we had refineries. Right? So what has happened? So in the agro sector, we have a lot. We are blessed. We are blessed it with a lot of resources, agro resources, even mineral resources. But we haven't been paying attention to these things. So if you look at my detailed uh, uh, um, uh, manifesto for the agro resources, we can create smart agro, over 20,000 uh, 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 um, products that can we can increase production output to global level while applying the PVC model. I call it PVC. That is primary producti uh, productivity, value addition, and, uh, 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 and uh, technology. It's important to in talk about value addition because we are used to just uh, producing raw materials, and that is where the West has left us. Just raw materials. Just stay there. Just produce the raw. Just cocoa and all that. And uh, Ghana just experienced it with Switzerland where they were just buying the cocoa and leaving it li like that. That became their mainstay of economy, just like we had crude, right? But today, they woke up and said, no, 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 no. We can't, you just can't be buying the raw cocoa. Come and set up your uh, uh, processing plant here. We also want to make our own chocolates. If you want to take the uh, refined um, uh, processed cocoa, now we have value to it. We can earn more money. These are the things that we're talking about. We have products that we can cycle out in 90 days. Some of the, like rice, uh, maize, these pro can be cycled out in 90 days and we can do it three times in a year. So we shouldn't be talking about, oh, we don't have food. That takes care of food security. You understand? We apply technology. And then the value addition, including processing plants, uh, 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 mark packaging, and marketing for export, global export. We are going to get revenue, uh, foreign exchange for, for all these things. Yes, I can, yes, I will believe you because uh, my daughter, who is one of the universities, doing, she's studying food uh, science technology. Mm. She's uh, doing her project on uh, getting uh, what they call cassava flour, so that you can just mm. uh, uh, put hot water, pour it to the floor, mix mm. it, mix and it. you get your. Uh, uh, book, yes. Of yes. So these are part of the processing you are talking about. Let me give you an example. Um, um, the cocoa plantation around the um, Calabar region and all that, right? You know, I have, as a consultant, I've been involved in these things. And you have association of Nigerian farmers. What do they do? And they just gather these things, aggregate them, and the Indians they come and buy these things at cheap price. They go out and a, a metric ton of cocoa is being sold for six thousand dollars, whereas they come here in the bushes and they buy them for six hundred thousand dollars a metric ton. You understand? You see what we're doing. But I was involved in a project where we wanted to set up a processing cocoa processing plant. You know, if you set up that plant, you have a buyback contract of over fifty million dollars. So, which means your exit strategy is is clear. You understand? And you now add value to the cocoa. We make more money. So these are the things that we're talking about. You're talking about your daughter, where you can do the cassava. Uh, uh, That's ancillary services. If you go to Ohaji uh, uh, sorry, uh, other palm, you just take the, the, the palm fruit, press it, get just a liter of uh, palm oil. How much is it? 18,000 naira, 20,000 naira. But if you take it one step further and bleach it, it becomes the refined palm oil, RPO. If you take it further and bleach it, that's why you get olein and starlin. It becomes more, 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 more expensive. But we just leave the craft. Even the shell of the palm oil, palm, palm, palm front becomes uh, another alternative to coal because it burns without residue. 
they are selling these things in Ireland. You know, so you just have to have the vision and the knowledge to be able to apply these yes, things. Yes, that's a vibrant, talking, thinking, reasonable uh, a candidate that has all it takes. Mm -hmm. It's it's a consultant. So, sir, let me still go. All we are talking about now boils down on bad governance. Absolutely. Which is poverty. Look at the problem we have today. We have mm -hmm. uh, 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 subsidy removal from the fuel. The poverty rate is high. Mm -hmm. Everyone is uh, uh, under the music of fire by trying to know what to do. So what will you do in order to reduce poverty and create wealth and kind of in the other way around create employment? No, tell me. Uh, I believe we've we've been going around and saying all these things. Uh, yeah, we, we've said that. But l let me tell you one thing, um, and this is very critical. Um, everybody's not on the same level, and it's important for us to understand that. There are, like I talked about, the youth. There are very smart young kids that are technologically inclined. There are also people that are not inclined in that way. They, they just prefer artisan work, they just prefer uh, little, little things like that. We have to also understand that. That's why our curriculum must be tweaked so that we can apply contemporary meto uh, teaching methodology. So we can also encourage vocational studies and all that and support them with uh, 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 the small SMEs, support them with entrepreneurial mentorship so they can also thrive. Everybody's not going to be a computer wizard. Everybody's not going to have CCNA or do project management or Agile or Scrum Master. No. But some people just want to uh, do other things that they are inclined. But now, uh, there's nothing. The, the, the common thing anybody can do now is just, if you have a driver's license, uh, get a bus, bus emo, and be driving. Because that's the only thing that they can lay their hands on, KK or that. But if you have aspiration to do other things, the government has to support. The government has to be the bull, be the bulwark for this revolution, and it all takes about it takes vision and knowledge to do this. So we are going to do that in terms of making sure from school, looking at uh, tweaking the curriculum. You've got teachers also that are teaching with uh, 25 years old uh, certificate. Uh, remember, just look at a, a car you, that was a Mercedes Benz that was made 25 years ago. Of course, it's antique. But you have teachers doing those things. We have to also bring our teachers up and train them, recertify them, give them, bring them up to par with the global technology uh, 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 um, uh, apparatus that is there for them to apply good t t teaching to our kids and also encourage these kids to choose the right career path so that. You can have a seamless transition from school to work. You understand? That's going to create a more fulfilling uh, 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 workforce, a more productive work workforce. So that's what we're going to do. But most of all, making the right little investments that will allow for private sector-driven economy is important. America runs on private sector. They are the ones that create the job, not the government. Okay. Um, capacity, integrity, and character is the hallmark of good leadership. True. Do you think you have these qualities to be able to uh, move forward or actualize mm -hmm. all these uh, views you have articulated here? Tony, capacity, um, integrity, and character. and character. Capacity is very subjective and very reflective, depending on the scenario and the context in which we're talking about. But let's, let's see. Capacity could be mental, it could be emotional, it could be psychological, it could be physical, but what is important is even the office of uh, the governor, having that office, executive governor, gives you the capacity. It's just like power and authority. Now, the, your ability to be able to harness the resources available and put them into production to get the desired result now determines whether you are have the mental capacity, you have the vision to be able to be in that seat. So yes, uh, my ability to see pitfalls, my ability to see deficiencies in the government or automatically gives me the ability, the capacity to be able to now say, these things are not right, I could do them differently, I could do them better because I have the vision, I have the knowledge. Capacity is vision, it's vision that drives this world 
and that is what we're coming. We, we, I, I am about the youngest running this thing, and I'm, 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 I have the best of both worlds. You know, I've, I've lived abroad, I've schooled abroad, uh, I'm, I have the global exposure, and I have the knowledge. So we have, have to key that into this system. Pope Francis said, a church that does not open up its doors will soon fall sick within the vitiated environment of its enclosure. So that means we as a people must open up. There has to be a commingling of ideas. Our people in diaspora have a lot, a lot of contribution to do. We have been doing this here, this way, over years, and we haven't gotten anywhere. Things, things are bad. So we must infuse new ideas, new experiences, and that's how. It's, and that is what I represent. Okay, let me ask you this uh, because time is not uh, mm. in our favor again. You are a new breed. Yeah. You are not uh, the usual politician. Even by your spoken words, mm. because uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. Mm. Uh, because time we have less than four minutes. The first one is: What do you think are your chances to clinch this uh, position, the governor of Imo State, and how? Do you rate assess the present government we have in Imo State now? Well, it's not my business to assess the present government. It's not my business. Uh, the people of Imo would do that assessment. Okay. Um, but uh, what are my chances? Yeah. Wonderful. My chances are as bright as the star. I'll tell you why. Because I just said it earlier that the Imo people are desirous to sign a new social contract. And that's a fact. It's a fact, Tony. We're talking about unemployment. You're talking about people dying every single day. You mentioned Ejemekuru, Izombe, Uguta too, all those places. It's all deserted with heavy military presence. Why? So these, these things are there. They are facts. I'm not just rolling out statistics. So Imo people are desirous to have a new Imo. We have a lot of work to do. We must rebuild Imo. So my chances are bright, wonderful. And luckily, I'm running under the platform of APGA. ABGA is the only political party that has affiliation with the Igbos, you know. So we must come back to the drawing board. If we must grow as a people, we must look inwards. There's this perceived uh, 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 feeling of marginalization of the Igbo. So we've tried the other parties on the national level. It hasn't given us what we want. So why don't we come back? If Ojuku were to be alive, he would still be in ABGA, right? The P2B we're talking about today started his career in ABGA. So I am the flag bearer of Abga. I must amplify the viability of my party, which is Nkabunkani. We must come back to, to, to our roots and look inwards to grow. So I want to uh, appeal to Ndimo, Ndibo by extension, to look inwards. Embrace Abga. It is our party. Aishi, onye yokama. It is better to look inwards embrace your own and let us now bring back the glory days of Imo State. Let us look ourselves we are resilient people. We are dogged fighters. We have the skills. We have the human capacity. We have what it takes to make this state grow. So Abga is the party. Abga is where we can say this is our own and we can trust that it's our own. We can't uh, be waiting for the other parties to give us direction. Uh, they have failed. They have really failed. If I can use that oxymoron, it has been a successful failure. You know, a successful failure. So Abga has produced the governor in this state. Abga is the party for the common man. I'm a common person. I am not the nominal politician. I'm a common person. I feel their pains. I have been here in this country. I have stood still. I have in entrenched myself in the system. And I've stood through all the ups and downs. I've had my own personal experiences that have shaped me to this point. So these are the things that I'm also applying to doing this. Um, so okay. my chances are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the people must rise up and say enough is enough. You know, when the righteous is on the throne, I heard your gentleman say that the last time, when the righteous is on the throne, the people rejoice. I wonder which uh, righteous man has been on the throne and the people are rejoicing. So it's time for the righteous to be on the throne. It's a righteous man that has the moral values. We must bring back the values, the values that we are known for. How can you see someone now take a cutlass and cut the head of someone? Is that what we're known for? The sanctity of human life is no longer respected. Uh, the value system of uh, uh, having, uh, uh, appreciating hard work and education is no longer there. Our children want to cut corners because they feel, you know, if you get money, nobody questions you, and that is what happens here. 
So these things must be brought back. Our values. Is we, we are, I embrace technology and all that, but we can also have that. We should build upon it. We can have that as an added advantage with the peace and serenity and the value system that we are known for. Yes, uh, the governorship candidate of uh, Abga, uh, Anthony Chidebele Ijogo, <coughs> a financial management expert and a business development expert whose experience has spanned close to 30 decades. He has spoken and you've heard him and I have to say, sir, thank you for being our guest. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, we are happy that um, oh, the compartment shows your capacity, your integrity and your character. Thank you for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Ndimo. I enjoy our people to come out in mass and vote for our own. Vote for Abga. Vote for the new breath of fresh air, of initiative and uh, character and capacity and integrity and the will to do the right thing is important. Our people constitute a great deal of security. Let's not feel like we are a conquered people. I've read the book Animal Farm where people are now caged. Even within their uh, own caged environment, they are also fighting. Uh, like in prison, you have a, a leader in the prison yard. We are not caged people. We can take back the state. We can begin the journey of rebuilding the state. And we must come out in mass and support. Abga provides the only clear, credible alternative in this election coming up. And please, let's join hands and rebuild Imo. Okay. Thank you. You had it from him. I take it from there. I come uh, November 11, governorship election. You have your choice to make. Yeah. So there are about 17 of them. You scream where, look at where. All that they say, all the glitters are not good. So you really do a thorough screen and what they call research on each candidate and their party and see what they, what they offer. So same time, same program, same station next week. My name is Thierry Benton Imadu. I say, may God bless Nigeria, Imo State in particular. I'm not being the other way around. God bless us all. Bye for now. and jingles. We have the manpower and our equipment is all digitized, giving you crystal clear signal and outputs. Our upgraded transmitter makes our reach far and wide. Watch and see from the nooks and crannies of Emo State and beyond. On terrestrial, search and see on 224.25 megahertz. On start times, we are on channel 103. And on Facebook and YouTube, it's and see live. Visit NTOWERI at Akanchawu Denwa Road over the Emo State for all your broadcast needs. NTAOWERI, pride of the heartland. We value your patronage.